dose of the Holy Ghost, and she gets a, she gets a little excited, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. And uh, but uh, it's a it's a tremendous a tremendous blessing. All right, thank you, fellows. I appreciate you doing that. All right, we're going to pick up where we left off now, just to give you a, a little bit of a recap again. Uh, take your Bible and come to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. And if nothing else, what I'm about to tell you will help you to get your Bible in the right place. Mark chapter 16. And it's good to be in the house of the Lord on a Sunday night. And um, uh, my wife bought a watermelon yesterday. So, you see, that doesn't excite y'all. <laughs> but it's either nothing or watermelon, so watermelon is like, hmm. So I'm looking, looking forward to that. All right, Mark chapter 16, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean you're getting out early. Because <laughs> it's in the ice box. The colder it gets, the better. Yes. All right, now, you want to get the context of this because oftentimes this passage, as well as one more that I'm going to give you, this passage is used to put pressure on you that you have a responsibility to go to all the world. You have a responsibility to tell everybody about Jesus Christ, but whether you tell them or don't tell them does not affect when the Lord comes. The Lord's coming with 10,000 of His saints, whether you want to believe it or not. That's the second advent. But the Lord's coming in the rapture, even though people say we've now lost our interest in it. I haven't. Amen. I'm ready to go. Amen. I'm ready for somebody else to come up with some other time that they think He's coming, and I'll look forward to that too. But the bottom line is, if you're ready to die, uh, then you're ready to go. But many of those individuals have been teaching for years that God's waiting for the last one to fill up the body of Christ, and then He'll come. How many of you heard that? Yep. Well, that puts it on you then, that until you go find the last one, then the Lord's going to prolong it. No, that's not true. The Lord's going to come, ready or not. And when He's had enough, just like Noah's flood, He's going to say, okay, that's it, Noah. Uh, get on the ark, and I'm going to shut the door, and nobody else is getting in. Now, if you rightly divide your Bible, you'll understand that the gospel that is being preached here in Mark 16 cannot be your gospel. It can't be because, number one, Paul doesn't even know about it when Mark chapter 16 is written. Amen. Second of all, it can't be because it is accompanied with baptism and signs, wonders, and miracles. So it's not your gospel. It is a gospel, but it is not your gospel. I mean, I'll show you the one in Matthew here in just a minute. I'll show you what they do sometimes to put you in a headlock. As if uh, going home to heaven is dependent upon you. No, you trust Jesus Christ, He gets you to heaven. Uh, but you're not the one that finishes filling up the boat. Well, the last one, this will be the last one. If you get the final one, that's just to try to encourage you to get more people to come to church. Mark chapter number 16, look if you will please in verse number 14. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. By the way, that was the women that came and saw him after he was risen. And then also when the other ones came in there, the apostles didn't believe it either. Sometimes a woman's right whether you like to admit it or not. Amen. Especially when it comes to talking about Jesus. Amen. Good preaching. What happened to the amens there, fellas? Uh, Sarah was right half the time. Yeah, well, Jezebel was never right. Well, that may be true, but if you're married to Sarah, at least you can count on 50% of the time being right. And he said unto them, the eleven, go ye unto all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, that's a great thing for you to say, uh, but these converts right here have to do with the apostles uh, going out and ministering to them. And he believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. All right, Brother Waters, you pray and ask the Lord to bless the service. Would you please, sir? Father, we give you thanks uh, once again, Lord, for bringing us here, Lord. We thank you for this place. We thank you for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ, Lord. We thank you for a pure, uh, pure book and a, your pure Amen. word. We ask now that you'll fill the preacher, Lord, and you just give us what we need tonight. In Jesus Christ, name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Come to Matthew chapter number 28 as you're being seated. Matthew chapter number 28. Now in Mark chapter 16, you noticed in, in Mark chapter number 16, you noticed that there were signs. Did you see that? And the gospel was of the kingdom. And that kingdom, because we know that it is connected with works 
and baptism, what kingdom is it? Kingdom of heaven. That's a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. So the majority of this is given by Jewish apostles. Right? And it is preached predominantly to who? Good. You got it. All right, so when he says go into all the world, then they would have been preaching that, and they would have been preaching the kingdom of heaven. Even though he's already died, but they don't understand anything else to preach. You say, why? Paul's not given the gospel uh, of the kingdom of God until Acts chapter number 9. Now remember this, and I'll come back to it, and I'll show you that in just a little while. This gospel is 1 Corinthians 15. Preacher, I can't remember all this. Just keep going over it enough times. You'll get it. You'll be surprised how much the Lord will give you. It doesn't, don't get intimidated by this and don't get frustrated by it. Just stay after it. Just stay after it. Much study, the Bible says, is weariness to the flesh. This will get you closer to Jesus Christ. Make sense of your Bible. That way when you pick it up and read it, you say, well, who's talking? Well, it's God. Who's He talking to? The Jew. Okay, good. I'm not the Jew. Who's He talking to? The Gentile. Okay, I'm no longer a Gentile. Why? There's neither Jew nor Gentile in the body of Christ. Who's He talking to? The church. Okay, I better pay attention. The church is Pauline epistles. That's Romans to Philemon. When you're talking about those things, you're talking to do doctrine for the church. Romans to Philemon. You want to make a note of that. Why? That's like a pair of glasses for you. You say, what is that? You view the whole Bible through Romans to Philemon because you're the church. If you could learn that one thing right there, it'll help you make sense of your entire Bible. That way you'll know sacrificing animals is not for you. That way you know you have to, you have to realize that you don't have to worry about abstaining from pork and shellfish and catfish and, and keeping the ceremonial law and having church on Saturday instead of the first day of week, which is Sunday. That way you understand that you don't have to worry about keeping the Levitical law, the law in Numbers, the law in Deuteronomy. That handwriting of ordinance is nailed to the cross. You have a circumcision made without hands. Your soul's cut loose from your body and you're not saved by works, you're saved by grace. And if you learn that, then you realize every time I pick up the Bible and I get into those passages that deal like we said this morning with Matthew, and I'll get there this evening, Acts and Hebrews. How many of you in here are Hebrews? None. Hebrews, James, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Is there good stuff in James? Sure there is. There's a great passage in there on tongues. There's a great passage in James chapter number 1 talking about enduring temptation. Uh, in James chapter number 4, faith without works is dead. There's some good things that are there. Uh, faith cometh by hearing there. He says that to you in another passage in the Gospels. But then he gives you this. He said, be ye hearers of the word, uh, be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. So there's some good things in James, but in James 5, you got somebody calling for the elders of the church and slinging 40 weight oil around there and calling for healing. Well, in the tribulation, that'll, go, that'll fit perfectly for the Jew, but you don't sling oil on people. You say what? You pray for them. If you could heal, and my buddy's back there with a busted shoulder, then bring him up here, throw oil on him, and he'll get well. I talked to somebody yesterday who's got cancer, bad deal with cancer. Well, if you can heal, then heal her up. I know somebody right now, there's a family in the church here, has a son who's got cancer, bad cancer. Well, if you can pray, then have him be healed. The Bible says you pray the prayer, and the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, and the prayer of the, the, of the, of the sick, or the prayer of the righteous man shall heal the sick. Well, 144,000 male virgin Jews can heal the sick. You couldn't heal a dead cat. It's not for you. You may or may not make it. The Apostle Paul certainly didn't make it. Now you want to make sure that you understand that. And I'll go back over that. These are transitional books. And whenever you're in a transition, that's not a good place to get doctrine. Here's something worth writing down. Whether you want to or not, it's your choice. But here's something worth writing down. You never, ever interpret an unclear passage based on other unclear passages. You always interpret an unclear passage based on clear passages that clearly state what is doctrinally true. In other words, if there's an unclear passage that you don't understand, don't go to another unclear passage to give you light on it. 
And if you don't get the thing completely worked out, stick with the things you do know and don't delve into things you don't know anything about. You know, uh, asses under the myrtle trees and all that other kind of things like that. You say, what is all that? You can guess at it, but you're not going to know. And that's not going to help you much in your practical life. All right, now notice in Mark 16, these things have to do with the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. It has to do with works, baptisms connected with it, Jewish apostle to Jews. Now let's look over here at another passage that's misused. You say, why? We're transitioning kingdoms. We're fixing to make a change here, but you've got to remember this is before Acts chapter number 7. How do you know? Has anybody got an old Schofield Bible or even if you've got one of the other reference Bibles up there in the middle there, there'll be either Usher's or Unger's chronology. You see that? It'll say 33 A.D. This is at the death of Christ. Alright, flip over real quick to Acts chapter number 7. Acts chapter number 7. And look at the chronology there. What's your, what does the chronology say in your Bible? A.D. what? 33 A.D. Well, so it's the same time Jesus Christ was here, right? Right? No, He's already dead. It's the same year. Acts chapter number 7 is 225 days after what I'm about to show you. You got to remember that. You say, why? This is the offering of the kingdom. Apologize for this color. I need to get me a red marker. Uh, by the Holy Spirit. And I'll give you the breakdown on it in a minute, but they've rejected God in the Old Testament, clearly stated in the New Testament. They rejected Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. There's only one more thing left, and that's the Holy Spirit. And Stephen's preaching, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. And when they say goodbye to that, three strikes, you're out, and then you start into a different kingdom altogether. The kingdom of heaven leaves, and the kingdom of God comes in. All right, now watch this thing in Matthew chapter number uh, 28. Look at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples, okay, <laughs> who is it? Verse 16, Matthew 28, 16. Then the eleven disciples, who is it? The eleven disciples. Are you one of the eleven disciples? Went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw Him, have you seen Him? They worshipped Him, but some doubted. Can't blame them for that. They're a little bit nervous about it. They don't feel bad. You doubt. He doubted also. And Jesus came and spake unto them. Who's He speaking to? The eleven. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and what? And you're commanded to preach. You're commanded to preach. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. They're in Galilee. They're not in Jerusalem. Notice this. Teach what? All nations. You're commanded to preach baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Your baptism has nothing to do with baptizing somebody as part of salvation. Teaching them to observe whatsoever things I've commanded you. Have you understood what that is? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, wa foot, foot washing. All of those things that He commanded them to do. Go only to Israel, keep the Sabbath, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. All of those things. And lo, I am with you always. Well, look what shows up there. Even unto the end of the world. The end is always a reference to the end of the tribulation. That thing would have gone right off into the tribulation. Whatsoever I commanded you, the apostles. Nobody in Acts is baptized that way. They're baptized in the name of Jesus in the, in the book of Acts. At the end of the world is a reference to the tribulation. All nations, Peter, James, and John are talking about all the Jewish nations. They're bringing them what? The gospel of the kingdom. Jesus didn't send them to baptize. and we're, I mean, didn't send us to baptize. He told us to preach. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3. Bear with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now we're a Baptist church. And we believe uh, in baptism. Make it 1 Corinthians 1. But we believe in baptism not for salvation. We believe in baptism for the purpose of showing something that's already occurred in your life. Baptism is a, a sign to other people in the sense of it's a testimony. Of what? It's a testimony of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not to be confused with the Mormons that say we're baptized for the dead. 
You're not baptized for the dead. That's the most foolish thing I've ever heard. That by your baptism, you can move somebody out of hell or somebody that's in a graveyard and you can move them into heaven to become a part of your heavenly family. The only way they can become a part of your heavenly family is through Jesus Christ. They have to get into the kingdom of God by one way, by Him, the King. And it comes by a new birth. And that new birth can't be illustrated. It can't be uh, 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 hit or, or, or hammered hard enough. There's only one way to Jesus Christ in the age in which you live, and that is salvation by grace through faith, believing in the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, plus nothing. Plus nothing. Whenever you add something to it, you adulterate it. Well, they believe in the death, burial, and the resurrection, but they think Mary is the closest way to be able to get there. you got a problem. Mary don't get you anywhere. You say, well, they believe in adding baptism. You just adulterated it. If I had a glass of water sitting up here right now and one of you went out there and got a, oh, I don't know, a dropper full of uh, gasoline and just put a dropper full in the, in the uh, water, would it just contaminate part of the glass or the whole glass? So it only takes a little leaven to leaven the whole lump. You're living in the days of nighttime. At nighttime, out come the shammers and the, the individuals that are trying to rob you and trying to be apostates and they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes by just putting a little bit of something in there, just, just a little tiny bit. The most dangerous lie is 90% truth. That passage in the book of Matthew, the individual said, Go into all the world and preach the God, teach, uh, teach in all nations. You're supposed to preach. Now let me show you how that's contrary. I'm going to get to this in 1 Corinthians 1 in a second. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, Preach the Word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Meaning that when you're preaching, you're supposed to preach doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but heap to themselves what? Teachers. Teachers. But that's what the apostles were told to do. See? If you don't rightly divide your Bible, what you think is, I'm supposed to go to Bible study fellowship or something, and I'm supposed to go around and sit around and, and learn more about the Bible and sit around. No, you're supposed to go for preaching. The time will come when they will not endure sound art, but heap of themselves teachers having itching ears and be drawn away of their own lusts. So the next thing you know, and turned unto fables. So the next thing you know, the modern movement moves away from preaching and moves toward teaching. You say, why? Because it grows the intellect. The more you know, the more you think that you're better than other people. The more it plays to you. And the words of how somebody talks to you, the way they deliver it is more important than what they say. So if a preacher gets up and raises his voice, well, that, that can't be preaching. No, that is preaching. Amen. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. You know, well, most people, their idea of exhortation is, is I hope you have a good day today. <laughs> well, you wouldn't want a cheerleader like that. I remember years ago, my wife and I went to a fancy place. Some people had given us a, some uh, a gift certificate thing. We went to a fancy uh, place in a hotel, and I'm walking down that big old massive hallway. That hallway must be at least as wide as this building is, if it's at, at anything. I'm walking down that hallway, and I hear the biggest commotion you've ever heard in all your life. Man, I mean screaming and hollering and jumping up and down. I'm thinking, man, they're either killing somebody or it's WWF going on in there, man. I mean, somebody's jumping off the ring ropes and hitting somebody with a bionic elbow or something, man. I mean, they were going insane. And so I opened up the door. My wife had gone to the restroom, and I opened up the door, and I looked in there, and there's this little bitty fellow up there, and he's running back and forth. He's got one of these little microphone things on, and he's sweating to beat the band, and he's screaming and hollering and that kind of thing. And I thought, I've got to hear what he's hollering about. They're all there with their Starbucks, you know, and they're all jacked up on caffeine, you know, and, and they're all standing there. They're about to throw the caffeine through the roof, or the coffee through the roof. And I'm listening to the guy. You know what he was jacked up about? Medical supplies. We've got the answer for everybody. This is going to make your bottom line go up. You're not going to believe in man. He sounded like somebody throwing out bids and all that. And they're like, yeah. And he goes, and we can do it, can't we? Yeah. And I mean, they kept going out and thinking, man, good night alive. And if a Christian does that, they're like, oh, you shouldn't be getting all excited about that. They come out there. She's about ready to come out. They're coming out in droves, man. And they're like, oh, man, I can't wait to get back home. I'm going to be a millionaire. You can dream it all you want to there, big boy, but unless you're willing to sweat, you ain't going to be no millionaire. But he thought, you know, I got the answer. Exhortation is supposed to be something that excites you, but people don't think there anything about it when it comes to business, but let a preacher get up and do that. Oh, you need to tone it down. Yep. Teachers, 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 teachers. Sophisticated. That's not biblical preaching. 
Uh, so what you want to understand is, is that it's moving in that direction. The Bible predicts it going in that direction. You don't have to go in that direction. Uh, but the number of preachers is beginning to shrink. You say, why? When God gets ready to damn a nation, meaning to pronounce judgment on a nation, He sequesters the preachers. The Bible says in the book of Amos, He says, in the last days there'll be a famine in the land, not of preaching, but of hearers. They get where they won't listen anymore. They don't want to hear. They don't like the tone. Too much television, too much internet, too much people soft soaping it and giving you what you want and what you think you need and so on and so forth. And so then somebody gets up and says, you know, prepare ye the way of the Lord or tells you, prepare for the judgment seat of Christ. You're like, why has he got to be like that? Because you're going there one day. Because if you're saved, you're going to give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ for everything done in the body, whether it be good or bad. Now, I'm supposed to prepare you for that. I'm supposed to afflict you if you're comfortable and comfort you if you're afflicted. That's what my job is. You think it's easy to get up here and tell people about their self and tell them about their sin and that kind of a deal? Try it on. I'll give you the pulpit. And then you realize everybody doesn't like you. See, it's unusual here. You ask these guys that preach. I preach enough places to know you people want the truth. You're an odd bunch of people. It ain't that way everywhere you go. Amen. Fill up the church on a Sunday night, and you know, you're sitting there like little teeth and eyeballs with a napkin around there going, you know, you better give us something to eat, man. <laughs> you know, one guy called me up the other, uh, this, this afternoon. I was finishing up in a meeting there before we left to go grab a little bite to eat there at the Sino Cat. And I, I uh, got on the phone and he said, he said man, I, the harder the better. He goes, how come somebody wouldn't like preaching on hell and the judgment seat of Christ? I said, I don't know, Brother America, I guess. I, he's from way down in Indonesia. And I said, I don't, I don't know, I don't have any idea. He goes, well, I think you need to turn the heat up a little bit. He said, a matter of fact, if you'd have a service for six hours, I'd tune in. <laughs> I said, well, then I'll talk to Brother Sam. He can just hook them up that way. I can't imagine six hours of service. I might could do that, though, once in a while. <laughs> All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm showing you how to rightly divide your Bible. You say, why? The gospel of the kingdom of heaven is different than the gospel of the kingdom of God. You say, which one do you get in on? The easy one. It was easy for you. It ain't easy for him. All right, now notice the Apostle Paul comes along here and he says this. There's contentions in verse number 11 among you. There's divisions in verse number 10. And then he says, now I say to every one of you, I am of Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm Cephas and I'm Christ. So there's divisions going on. Why? Because the Apostle Paul has come on the scene now and he's preaching the death and burial and the resurrection. Do you understand? He's preaching still to some Jews and some Jewish proselytes that are Gentiles and they've heard, hey, wait a minute, I'm, I'm from Peter. Peter said, repent and be baptized. Paul said, yeah, all that's changed now. So it would be a hard thing for him to grab a hold. So Paul is trying to, to get the situation straightened out. Verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. So he did baptize. Lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Paul said, I'm not keeping a baptismal record to send to the cooperative program in the convention to let them know how our church is growing by based on how many people I got baptized. <laughs> well, if that's the case, we'd be so full here, man, you'd be running out the windows right now. There's a few people I baptized, I kind of wish I'd have held them under a little while longer. <laughs> they might still be here. At least the bubbles would be around. When I baptized Biggin here, man, he was a little bigger than he is now right there. It looked like Shamu coming up out of the ground, out of the water there. But I didn't lose him. Water comes up over the side of that thing. It's like anybody in the front row needs to get an umbrella. And the Bible said, for watch it, verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize. What is he doing? He's telling you that the ones that are baptizing as part of the plan of salvation, it's gone now. Not that their baptism was wrong, but that no longer is he preaching a gospel involving works and having baptism associated with it. Paul said, I did baptize. You understand? But I didn't come to baptize. I came to do what? Preach. Preach the gospel. 
How that Christ died for your sins according to the Scripture, was buried, raised again the third day according to the Scripture. Now, that's to try to explain to you. Notice how he preaches. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. All right, now come, if you will, please, to Matthew chapter number 21. Matthew chapter 21. That's Genesis, Exodus, Matthew. Matthew chapter 21. I love Sunday night. Amen. Now I'll show you these three things if you want to make a note of it. There's three rejections. John the Baptist comes along and he gets to preaching and he says the kingdom of heaven's at hand. And Matthew chapter number 21, pick it up in verse number, uh, let's see, 23. It'll be good. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him by he was, as he was teaching and said, By what authority dost thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? Isn't that always the question? Why do you say that's the question? I told you in the very beginning, the whole thing was about this. It's about a throne. Who's the boss? Make it practical for you? Be glad to. Who runs your life? Your wife? Your husband? Your kids? Your job? You? Or him. It's always a struggle for the throne. You're either at his feet or he's at your feet. You're either on the cross or he's on the cross. Paul said, I die daily. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Your soul is saved. Your flesh isn't saved. You have a choice every day whether or not to go to Calvary and crucify yourself or whether or not you want the Lord to stay up there. You can't have it both ways. You can't live part in the world and part out. I mentioned to you this morning, sitting by the gate. Those individuals are sitting there and one of them is sitting here inside the gate and he can see Jesus in the garden and he can still see the world over here. It's like having a car where the battery keeps running down and the alternator's putting out like it's supposed to and everything seems to be running as long as the car's running, but you shut it off and leave it more than 12 hours, the battery runs down. And then you figure out after a little while there must be something draining the battery. And you call the mechanic out there and he takes a look at it and come to find out that uh, battery cable has been leaning on the frame and it's been sawing back and forth until all the insulation has been rubbed off of it and now there's a raw wire that's just laying on the frame. And when you shut the car off because that raw wire is laying on the frame, it drains the battery. Do you know what happens to some of you in your Christian life? You're hooked up with the world and that no insulation, no separation, no division between you and it. You're sitting right by the gate and you reach out there and it's just a trickle charge, just a little bit. It just comes off a little at a time. It's not enough you could even start a fire with. It's just gradually trickling it out until you go out there the next morning. <coughs> and then it don't run no more. You say, why is that? Because you have no insulation and your wires are on the frame. That's what the world does for you. So you get out there and you go through all this worldly stuff and then you wonder why you've got nothing left to serve Jesus with. <laughs> because your battery cable is laying on the frame and it's draining the energy. It's taking the juice out of you. That'll help you if you realize you need to get away from the gate. Get away from just inside the gate, you know. Yep. Maybe okay to, you know, well, if I get to heaven, I'll be just inside the gate. You know, I'd, I'd just be inside the gate. Yeah, but that ain't going to work for you down here. That's modern Christianity. That's carnal Christianity. That's one foot in the world and one foot in the, when, with Jesus. That's one hand in the world and one hand on Jesus. Well, sooner or later, going to pull you apart. Yep. Sooner or later, you're going to realize you have a lackluster Christian life and you'll be able to enjoy your physical life as much as you ever have. But you won't have any power to overcome sin in your life. You say, why? Something draining your battery. Connection to the world, connection to the world. You say, oh, preacher, you sound like a cult leader. No, you're in the world, but you're not to be of the world. The love of the Father is not in you, he says, if you love the world. I'm giving you a Bible, but you, can't, but you can't let it go. I just got to have it, I just got to have it, I just got to have it, I just got to have it. Social media, television, newspapers, new magazines, all the other kind of stuff that just keeps you plugged in, keeps you plugged in, keeps you plugged in. Yeah, but and when you've plugged into it, it's also draining you. It's having an adverse effect. You're plugged into it, but it's pulling energy out of you. You think I'm kidding you, that's the emotion. 
You watch, you got the Mount Kilauea or Kilauapa or whatever it is over there in, in Hawaii. It's going off, it's going off, it's going off. And now, you know, what happens if the edge drops off there and then we have to send out a tsunami warrant? I, I don't know. If it happens, send one out. Well, then California and Washington can be in some serious trouble. California's been in trouble since the day they were created anyhow. Yeah. Surely you know that, the land of fruit and nuts. Yeah. Right. But... <laughs> A tsunami hits there, it'd probably do a few hundred thousand dollars worth of improvements. But at any, but at any rate, I know that sounds so negative, so negative, terrible, terrible. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, you get to watching that news, you get all anxious about it. You get all worried about it. You get worried about Ken Jom Young flying a, a nuke over here. And now it looks like they're going to come together and have some kind of peace accord and everything's going to work out. And they're going to give somebody a, uh, the Pulitzer Prize or give them the Nobel Peace Prize or whatever it might be. And you got all jacked up about it and went to get you a foil hat with some tinfoil and that kind of thing to be able to watch out for the A-bomb when it comes. Or you get worried about chemtrails. They're trying to turn you into half animals and half uh, uh, humans and half machines. Didn't you know that's all the nanoparticles that you've been ingesting all this time? It's not just to make you sick. It's to turn you into uh, an, a part machine so they can control you. <laughs> you say it'll never happen. Oh, you might be surprised at the stuff they'll do. You watch movies about it all the time now. You have no idea where this is going. You say, where is it going? They're trying to recreate eternal life by making the parts in you that break down where they won't break down. They're trying to play God as it was in the days of Noah. You say, well, why they spray all this stuff around and why are they trying to do this or trying to eliminate populations and all that other kind of stuff? Same reason the devil's been trying to kill the Lord's seed for years. Shouldn't be nothing new to you. You watch the hurricanes, you watch the tornadoes, you watch the, the predictions for the bad storms this year and different things like that. Tornadoes tearing through Germany and tearing through Austria and we got a bad hurricane season coming up and it drains you. It drains you. You get anxious, you get fearful, you get what happens if and oh man, there, there's a shooting down in Texas. Yeah, there's shootings all over the United States on a regular basis. You don't have enough sense to see that they did that in the place where they're arming school teachers and there's a little more to the story than just a kid who got jilted by a girlfriend. It's not happenstance the way that stuff comes off. What has it done to get you looking there while they pull something over on you over here? I've told you that for years. You're not paying attention. When you see something that obvious, you start looking around. You'll see what they're hiding. I'm giving you the inside scoop. I'm telling you how to look at the news if you've got to look at the news. Don't look at the volcano going off and the shooting down there as tragic as it is in Texas. Look at some of the stuff coming out under the, under the rug going, uh-oh, 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 guess what? I guess they found out something they didn't want to find out and they don't want you to know they found that they've been lying all the time. It gets you excited and gets you interested and it gets you anxious. It steals your energy. And then you come to church and it's like, ah, snooze fest. What's the preacher so jacked about? Eternity. Amen. When we get to the judgment seat of Christ, Amen, try to get you encouraged about things to come in the future that I can guarantee you that are going to happen. I can't guarantee you're going to make it to the house. We got defib paddles over here and we keep a doctor or nurses here all the time. You say, why? Oh, well, sometimes the way I preach it to shock you into a heart attack, we got to have something to wake you back up. But we have that stuff around here all the time. You say, why? Well, there's no way. There's but a step between you and death. The boy sitting right over here on the second row, he about flopped out a couple of years ago. Felt like somebody was hitting him in the chest with a, a sledgehammer and take him down to the hospital. He's young, man. 20 years younger than me. The old man sitting right there had a widow maker go out on him. The old man back there had all kind of problems with his mom and his dad and his son. Gone. There's no guarantee you're going to make it out of here. Your age is no guarantee against it. You might make it to 60. You might not make it to 20. You say, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to tell you there's something more important than the cotton picking news and the weather channel. What's the weather going to be? I don't know. Well, I got wet. What does that mean? Well, either somebody's standing on the roof with a fire hose or it's raining. Amen. What's the weather today? I don't know. I'm sweating out here. That means it's hot. Yeah. What's it going to be? It's Florida. It could change any minute now. 
you know, I got to get home. It might rain. <laughs> you think? Yeah. <laughs> it might. Take your umbrella. All that stuff is done to take your emotions. Why? You're an emotional being. That's how they're able to run news channels 24 hours a day with breaking news. Everything's breaking something every time you turn around. Breaking news. We saw a frog leap six feet today. Most unbelievable thing we've ever seen. The sea turtles are headed to the ocean. Are you kidding me? And a guy went out there and hit one of them with a bat. Oh, child crew, cruelty animals, cruelty to animals. Put him in jail. He killed a sea turtle. You know I'm telling the truth. Uh, those shows are built around anxiety. They're built around fear. You know what the Lord's trying to tell you? The Lord's trying to tell you, be prepared for me coming. Quit worrying about all that stuff. Uh, they had an earthquake in Virginia. Did you know that? It was felt at further distances than those that have been in California. I wonder why. I don't know. Ask a geologist. What does that have to do with the price of the tea in China? Why do you care about an earthquake in California? You don't live there. Why do you care about one in Virginia? Washington's there. <laughs> Verse 24, Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John's, whence was it? From heaven, in other words, where did it come from? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say, from heaven, and we, he shall say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say, of men, we fear the people, and hold that John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. I'll tell you what that authority was. That authority was by God the Father. But he said, If you're not going to tell me, I won't tell you. How about that? The Lord said, I'll answer a fool according to his folly, or sometimes I won't answer a fool according to the folly. You know what he did? He boxed them in their own game. I got a question for you, he said. What's the question? John's baptism. Did God send it or did man send it? He boxed them right there. Well, if we say man, then John's a prophet. And if we say God, then he's the son of God. We ain't going to do that. And then the Lord said, well, then I'm not going to answer you either. You're not always compelled to give an answer. Mark chapter 15. Mark 15. All kind of stuff in this Bible. Isn't it an interesting book? It's an interesting book. I, I, uh, I, I hate these guys that have done nothing but teach people on a regular basis. They've taught them nothing but quit, stop, don't, and do. Ah, oh, there's so much more in the Bible than that. Man, you can enjoy Jesus. You can come to church on a Sunday night. Don't even get under conviction. <laughs> you say, what? Just learning about Jesus. <laughs> but the problem is, the closer you get to Him, you kind of get to feeling sometimes a little uncomfortable. <laughs> like you need your feet washed. You know how that is when He has a tendency to be talking to you about Himself. And then next thing you know, He's over there going, Boy, sure does smell around here. I tell you what. And he reaches over and gets him a basin of water and pours it into a big tub there, a big number 10 wash tub, and he girds himself with a towel, and all of them are thinking, what in the cat hair is he doing? And the Lord said, I'm down here to wash some feet. Yeah. They're having supper. Yes. And the Lord said, don't you tell me them boys weren't under conviction. Yeah. Sometimes you come to get a little teaching and you still get under conviction. All right, God in the Old Testament. Now watch. Look in verse, uh, or chapter 15, look in verse number 11. Mark chapter 15, verse number 11. The Bible said, The chief priest moved to the people, and he said, Rather release Barabbas unto them. Pilate answered and said unto again to them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call what? Come on now, what? King, 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 king. It's about a throne. King of the Jews. Watch what they say to him. And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, Why? Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out more exceedingly, Crucify him. So Pilate, willing to be content, the pe to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. There you go. There goes, the, goes Jesus Christ. 
They rejected God in the Old Testament. They just rejected Jesus Christ before He ever got to Calvary. He's not our Messiah. Crucify Him. Crucify Him. Crucify Him. Crucify Him. His blood be upon us and upon our children's children. People say, well, that means the Lord would hold other people accountable. No, He's holding the people that asked them for that prayer. They got their prayer answered. Look in Acts 7. Acts chapter 7. That Jew right now is under persecution, but you better not be the one persecuting him. You better not be worried about all that kind of stuff. You let the Lord handle that. That's still God's chosen people. Don't you become anti-Semitic. I don't care if you don't like them. If you don't like them, stay away from them. That's still God's chosen people. I'm going to give you something now that's going to shock some of you to pieces here. You, you white supremacists think you're the supreme ones and black supremacists think they're the ones and they're the chosen people. The supreme race in the whole world is the Jew. Amen. How's that one go for you? The most persecuted people on the face, the most hated people on the face of this earth is a Jew. That's a superior race to any other race that's around. That's God's chosen people. They'll do you backwards, forwards, sideways, and upside down. You can't compete with those people. You say, why? God's chosen people. Even though right now they've been banished, even though right now the only way they get in is through the kingdom of God, a new birth the same way you get in, that's still God's chosen people and God's still blessing them. And God scattered that group of people all around the earth. And every nation where those feet have been, God's going to bring into judgment. That means every nation in the world, that Jew's been scattered. But you better hear me when I tell you all this supremacy stuff and all this ru rulership stuff and all that, you better leave that to Jesus Christ and His people. Amen. Your, your kingdom is not this world. Right. Amen. If you'd quit trying to make it that way, you'd be a whole lot better off. Amen. I realize the United States has been sticking its nose in everybody's business for a long time. They call themselves the, the world's policemen and stuff like that. But if you do a little bit of reading, ladies and gentlemen, you'll find out you're not as much a policeman as you are a banker. And you take over a poor indigent people, countries and stuff so you can control their imports and their exports. You can control uh, their, their uh, reserves and things like that. And you can take over their banks. And other countries call your hand on it. And the reason they don't like you is because they know you're after their money. So you don't read. I can tell by looking at your face. Well, you know, God bless America. The Lord's like, boy, if you knew what your people were up to, you'd know good and well I wouldn't be blessing you. More than just because of homosexuality. I thank God for living in the United States of America. I thank God for every ounce of blood that was ever shed to be able to be here and to live in freedom and things like that. But ladies and gentlemen, it ain't the way it's drawn up. And if that's the case, if we reap what we sow as a nation, as a nation, as a nation, this country's got it coming. You say, how soon? Oh, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I don't know when the rapture's going to happen. But when the rapture happens, a third part of the world is burned. My personal idea about that is, is that it's probably be the United States of America that'll be roasted. You say, why are you worried about that? You ain't going to be here. Were you worried about checking your house when you came back during the millennium? It's going to be roasted. Now, I don't know that to be true, but I know this. I know when you go back into the tribulation period, the 144 male virgin Jews or 144,000 male virgin Jews are preaching. I know this. America is not mentioned. There must be a reason. Somebody hits the wrong button somewhere or something or another and your thing goes all to pieces. You say, well, the government's plan is to divide the earth and to divide the United States into three places and one goes to Canada, one goes to this, and one goes to that. And then you've got the new matter default that comes down there and it splits the thing with the east of the Mississippi and west of the Mississippi and you've got all that kind of stuff. Well, all that may or may not be true, but eventually when the rapture happens, ladies and gentlemen, as a governmental power, you cease to exist. You're going to be one government under the Antichrist. You, your nation. You say it'll never happen. Why are you worried about it? You ain't going to be here. There ain't nothing you can do to prevent it. Right. You say, why? Your Creator's behind it. Amen. You think you can stop Him? You can go up there and reason with Him? If you happen to hit the, uh, the, the New Jerusalem up there or happen to hit heaven before I do, go on in there and talk to Him about it. Say, now Lord, I sure appreciate it if you'd spare the United States of America. <laughs> and the Lord say, before you shoot your mouth off there, Sonny, you might want to read some history. Let me just play the video for you and you'll see some things that have been going on for years that you thought were all fair and good and righteous and all, like your Vietnam War. Uh, 
I'm getting a few more amens now than I used to. Some of you have been reading this kind of like, where did he get that stuff from? It's in the history books. It's hidden in plain sight. It's a conspiracy. Sure, it's a conspiracy. Why do you think they knocked off JFK and his brother? Amen. Why do you think they killed the straw man down in South Vietnam that was the president down there? Because they got together and said, we're going to stop this mess and we're not going to do it. And the money maker said, oh, no, you ain't. And Johnson comes in and fires up the war machine. And Nixon comes in and fires up the war machine. You say, why? Every bomb, it don't go bang, it goes cha-ching. The more ordinance they blow off, the more they have to create. Somebody's getting rich. Yes, I mean rich. Or <laughs> like, I don't know. I just, I, I'm not, I, I, I. Acts chapter number 7. Stay with me just a couple minutes. Now we're going to show you the rejection of the Holy Ghost. So it's God in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ in the New Testament, just before Calvary. And now Acts chapter number 7. Pick it up, if you will, please, in verse number 50. I'll make it 49. Heaven is my... Heaven is my... Throne, the earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Oh yeah, Lord, you did make everything. Here's Stephen. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, rejecting God, rejecting Jesus, so do ye. And the next thing you know, he's gone. And then Acts chapter number 8, here comes the Ethiopian eunuch that gets saved. That's your three rejections that are right there, that are, that are written. Come over to Romans chapter number 11. Romans 11. Can you stay with me for another moment? This will help you to keep your Bible straight. Can I say this about you? Though you have a lot of books written about you or the church age in this time period, are you beginning to realize that uh, you're not the focal point of the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> what a drag, isn't it? <laughs> that you're not the focal point. But did you ever look at what is the focal point? It's Him. Over 500 places in your Bible before Jesus Christ shows up on Calvary, over 500 places it talks to you about the second coming of Jesus Christ to take the kingdom. 500 places. You can't put three major doctrines together in the New Testament and come up with that many references. You say, why? The theme of the Bible is a kingdom. Yes. And it's the one who's bought and paid for it. He paid for it with His blood. And you get to be a part of it if you're saved. Well, I've never heard anything like that. Okay. Well, what does that mean? When I went to the first grade, I hadn't heard about multiplication tables. That didn't mean they didn't exist. <laughs> Daddy, they, they taught me something I've never heard before. <laughs> Good, you better learn it or I'll beat your hind end. <laughs> but it's funny when people hear something in church, it's kind of like, I never heard anything like that in church before. Oh, I went to church, I heard about salvation, morning, noon, and night. I've been saved for 40 years, but I've heard salvation morning, noon, and night. Nothing about the judgment seat of Christ. Nothing about the great white throne judgment. Nothing about eternity. Nothing about where you're going. Nothing about living right and doing right. All you hear about is go get more and bring them in here. Go get more and bring them in here until you're running around with your tongue hanging out and you don't know any more about Jesus than you did to begin with. That's the beginning of your relationship as we talked about this morning. Romans chapter number 11. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 13. This is the Apostle Paul. I'm not going to run all of these. For I speak to you who? Gentiles. Insomuch as I am the Apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. Who is that? That's the Apostle Paul. Verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. What is it? Lest ye should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. The mystery is Israel being blinded. And I told you I'll go over the seven mysteries when we get through with this. So what he's trying to say across to you, look at uh, Acts chapter 13. He's saying that now that you're... Uh, let's see, I've got to back up to get that one. Acts chapter 13. He said, blindness is in part to Israel. Now, remember on the other side of the chart where I showed you, I can use this one here. During the kingdom of God that's here now, spiritual kingdom, not meat and drink. You can't see it. It's not given with observation. Luke 17 and Revelation or Romans chapter 14. When the rapture takes place, 
the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and it's back to the Jew. Blindness in part is given to the Jew until the fullness of the Gentile. Do you understand? Until you go out, that's the fullness of the Gentile. The church age is closed, it's back to the Jew and that has to do with the tribulation which I don't have up here right now. The tribulation takes place after that and they're looking for a coming king. They can't get saved by grace through faith during that time. Why? 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 said because they received not the love of the truth that God had damned them and, because they, and that they would believe a lie. God sends them strong delusion according to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Now if that's the case, the time of the fullness of the Gentiles is at the rapture of the church. And then he goes back to the Israel and he takes the blinders off and he lets them see that. Acts chapter number 13. Two more verses and we'll go to the barn. Eat some watermelon or whatever you want to do. Banana sandwich or something. Acts chapter number 13. And Paul and Barnabas, verse 46, waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first be, have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you, spoken to who? The Jew. And since the Jew put it from him, and judge yourself unworthily for everlasting life, lo, we turn to the... Look at it, it's right in your Bible. Now, everybody close your eyes. Nobody looking around. How many of you have never seen that in your Bible before? Raise your hand. Okay, thank you for your honesty. Thank you. All right, you can open your eyes now. I just didn't want you looking around because if you're one of those that had seen it before, you're like, no, I read my Bible all the time. I, I, I knew that was in there. <laughs> Did you ever realize that, that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas were saying boldly, you Jews rejected it, so the Lord sent us to the Gentile? Don't tell me it's the same kingdom. It's not the same kingdom. The kingdom that Paul's offering is the kingdom of God, which is a spiritual kingdom. All right, one more. Romans chapter 15. One more. Now, does that make sense to you? It's kind of like, oh man, sigh of relief. I never, I never knew that was in there before. Ain't that something? Isn't it something that now I understand, Galatians chapter number 1, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach to you any other gospel than that which I preach, let him be accursed. So I say unto you, I say again, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach to you any other gospel than I preach, let him be accursed. Now I understand how people could preach it in different time periods, but if during the time Paul's preaching, during the gospel of the kingdom of God, if they preach it during that time, they're to be accursed. Not any other time. Probably none of you have not heard somebody say that you're preaching another gospel if you preach anything but Paul's gospel in any other time period. Well, then that means Jesus Christ is cursed. That means John the Baptist is cursed. That means every one of the apostles is cursed because none of them preached the kingdom of God. They all preached the kingdom of heaven and baptism was connected with it. That means everybody going all the way back to Adam that has works involved in their salvation. I'll consent to you there's grace in every dispensation. You say what? God giving man any chance to get saved is gracious. No matter how he does it, whether it's to build an ark or whatever it does, keep the law, it don't matter. God gives you a chance to get to heaven, that's gracious. But the way you got there, it's different. In the tribulation and out in the millennium. In the millennium, how are you going to teach salvation by grace through faith? How are you going to teach that in the millennium? Did you think about it? Jesus Christ is on the throne. Right. Well, you know, that anybody that's going to be cursed. Oh, the Bible says if they teach that, that they're to be thrust through and stoned. Why? They're teaching the second coming of the devil. It's another Christ. So what they're saying to you is, is that that's another Jesus. That's another gospel. Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven. Re Revelation 14, there's an angel from heaven preaching the everlasting gospel. He's not accursed, but he is not preaching the death, burial, and the resurrection. He says, get right, Jesus is coming. you got about 30 minutes to get ready. And that's it. That's Revelation chapter number 14. That's called the everlasting gospel. And you know what people have you to believe? Because they're lazy and I don't back up from it at all. Because they're arrogant, because they're lazy, and because they're a rebel. Because they're going to have it their way. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm telling you now, it is not the same gospel and you're not saved the same way in the Old Testament as you are in the New Testament. You don't even go to the same place. 
You say, what does that mean? Just basic rightly divide in the Bible. It answers all the questions that you have. Where do people go when they died? They went to the heart of the earth. You say, why? They couldn't go to heaven. Their sins weren't paid for. They were there on credit. Man, that's better than any platinum card you could ever have. <laughs> you know, you're down here on credit. You know, what, what bank is backing you? The bank of Jesus Christ. I guarantee you He's going to come and die and I'm out of here, man. All right, Romans chapter number 15. Romans chapter number 15. Look down, if you will, please, in verse number 15. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly to you of some sort as putting you in mind. I mean, he's saying in a nice way, I'm fixing to remind you of something. Because of the grace that is given to me, not we, this is Paul giving him grace, given to me of God. What is that grace? That I, Paul, should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. The Apostle Paul comes along there and says, Hey boys, I've been called to preach to the Gentiles, and I know it really bugs you Jews, and I'm sorry it's that way, but the Lord called me out, and as a result of that, i got to preach what the Lord wants me to preach, and I'm going to preach it, and it's not going to be the same thing you're doing. Now, here's what happens. Long story short, they jump in there and they say, Okay, Paul, we believe what you're saying. Now watch it. But we believe you still have to have circumcision. That's in Galatians. And Paul says, the circumcision or the not the circumcision. It has nothing to do with salvation. You say, what happened? It's the same thing today with people adding works to salvation. It corrupts the purity of salvation by grace through faith plus absolutely nothing. And you add anything to it, you've corrupted it. All right, let's stand together and be dismissed. <coughs> I realize I went a little long there. I apologize. I get a little... It's, it's hard to find a cut-off place there uh, and then try to bring you back in on Wednesday to it. It's just a hard thing. I'll be on this maybe another two or three... Th